So good afternoon and welcome to Inside the Vatican's Writers Chat this afternoon. I'm Christina Deerdirk and I am the assistant editor at Inside the Vatican Magazine. Um, and we are joined by Robert Moynihan, uh, our editor in chief. Um, just a note, we're keeping everybody on mute today until the end when we'll open it up for questions uh, if time allows. So our guest today is Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Dr. Kwasniewski is a graduate of Thomas Aquinas College in California, where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Liberal Arts and of Catholic University in Washington, DC, where he earned both a Master's and Doctorate uh, degrees in philosophy. He taught theology and philosophy in Austria for eight years and then joined the founding team at Wyoming Catholic College in 2006, where he taught philosophy and theology and led the choir in Scola. Peter's also a musician uh, with a keen knowledge and love of sacred music. Uh, he was at Wyoming Catholic until 2018. Now he's a scholar and author who's working feverishly to shore up tradition in the Catholic Church. Uh, its meaning, our understanding of it, um, because of the importance of tradition to our faith and the fabric of the church. And um, that's what we're going to talk to Peter about. I also should mention Peter's written 12 books. Uh, your bio says 10, but I think there's been a couple uh, additional ones in the past year, uh, including his two latest, Ministers of Christ, Defending the Separate Roles of the Clergy and Laity, and From Benedict's Peace to Francis's War, which is a series of essays by various authors reacting to Pope Francis's promulgation of the Motu Proprio Traditionis Custodes. And this is a topic... Many people are anxious to hear your views on, Peter. So welcome to uh, Inside the Vatican's Freighters chat today. Thank you so and, uh, much. Yeah, our friends who are part of the Zoom meeting have submitted um, some questions, but um, first uh, we'll get to those later. First, I'm just gonna ask you a few questions of my own. So tradition is the watchword uh, here. And so when we talk about tradition, what do we mean? People today are not the same as they were a thousand years ago. How can we think that it's fitting for us to do everything, even in our liturgical life, our ecclesiastical life, the same way it was done yes. for millennia, you know? I, I, uh, well, so, so, I mean, basically what we have to start with is just the word itself, right? Traditio paradosis in Greek, it just means that which is handed down. That's all it means. Uh, and when you go back to the New Testament, well, first of all, when you go back to the Old Testament, you see that God himself hands down certain laws and rituals to the people of Israel. And he says to them, you hand these down to your successors. So it's always a handing down of what's been given, the gift that's been given. And in the New Testament, right, our Lord, he, he transforms what was given to Israel um, he, he perfects it, he brings it to completion, but he still says to them, do this in memory of me. He says that about the Holy Eucharist, but it's really the kind of pattern of the whole Christian faith. What we hold as Christians, our creed, our dogmas, our morals, and our fundamental worship, especially the seven sacraments, never changes. That's always going to be the same from the time of Christ until the end of time. So no amount of social, cultural, political change is ever going to change those things, right? Um, and that's because God himself is unchanging. He's the truth and Christ is the truth. And he hands down to us the things we need for our salvation. Um, that being said, obviously there are ways in which the church develops over time. She ponders the mysteries of faith. She looks more deeply into, in, into them and derives new insights from them. That's how we get what's called the development of doctrine. Uh, and similarly with liturgical worship and with devotions and, and all kinds of prayer, um, the church develops more and more expressions and fuller expressions of the truths that, and the mysteries that she's always held from the beginning. And that's how we get development in liturgy as well. So the liturgy starts out kind of like a seed, like an acorn, and it grows into a mighty oak tree over many centuries. 
And the fundamental point that I want to make, because really the question you ask could be like an hour long answer. I mean, it's, a, it's like, what is tradition? Is the, but, but the fundamental point I want to make is the attitude within the church has always been that of St. Paul. Hold fast to what I have given to you, either by word of mouth or by writing. So the, the idea of holding fast to the inheritance we get from our, from our predecessors, from, our, from those who come before us, from, from those who run before us, that's what, uh, what predecessor literally means. Um, they run the race before us and they know more than, than we do. Uh, they've inherited and they've developed and they, have, they hand on to us certain treasury. And, we, and so the, the attitude of humble receptivity and grateful receptivity is fundamental in Catholicism. It always has been. Um, and it's actually rather shocking uh, to see moments in history when people won't hand on what's been given to them. That happened in the Arian crisis. They wouldn't hand on the faith of Nicaea, certain bishops and, and mostly bishops. Uh, and it happened with the Protestant revolt, you know, Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, Zwingli, all these people, they wouldn't hand on the faith and the worship of the church. It happened in the Anglican revolution. And it, it's happened again in the 20th century, right? This new wave of iconoclasm. So it, it's, it doesn't, you know, the, there are the respects in which people change culturally and socially, like what we wear, what we might happen to wear, that's not the same as what we believe, how we should live according to the commandments, and how we should worship God. Those things are traditional. Okay. Um, so uh, how we should worship God, that's what we're talking about primarily in liturgical matters. Um, can you give us a super abbreviated um, history lesson on the origins of the mass oh my. and i mean obviously it's the last supper but i mean the the the, the prayers and the, the form that has been handed down to us is it was it mostly a whole cloth early on were there accretions over the entire history of the mass and you know we yeah what so, came to us I think this is obviously a, another big question, um, and I just I want to say I want to recommend anybody who's watching this if you want to have a one volume perfect introduction to the history and theology of the traditional Latin Mass, you need to read Michael Fiedrowitz's book. Uh, it's called "The Traditional Mass: History, Form, and Theology of the Classical Roman Rite," published by Angelico Press. It is a masterpiece, and in one volume. You get everything, all of your questions will be answered <laughs> about these sorts of things. So I just preface my remarks with that. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what, we, what we need to understand is that the, the, even the mentality of our Lord and of the apostles was deeply conservative. So when they came, they didn't just invent a new liturgy whole cloth. They took the liturgy of Israel, they took the liturgy of the Jews, and they elaborated it. And yes, introduced new elements. I mean, of course, our Lord being God can introduce, he's the legislator, he can introduce whatever elements he wants, but he introduced them into the temple and synagogue worship. He took the temple sacrificial worship and made himself the lamb of that worship. He took the synagogue worship and made his gospel the heart of the synagogue worship. And so, and, and of course, the mass is a kind of fusion of the synagogue and the temple, the synagogue being like the, the what some people call the liturgy of the word or the mass of catechumens. And the temple, the sacrificial part, being the liturgy of the Eucharist or the mass of the faithful, right? So that's the kernel of the mass is right there in, in, in ancient Israel. And what you see in the early church, right, is um, you see a period of, of, of pondering what Christ has given and developing certain rituals around it, which, which came to be what we call the mass and the other sacramental rites. But these things are basically being done like in secret, in hiding during the age of persecution. So they're going to be done in the catacombs. They're going to be done in the homes of Christians. And they are ritual actions. They're not like casual, like living room, let's kick back and play guitars. But, but it, it, it was still a ritual action, but it was not, um, it couldn't have the fullness uh, in an age of persecution that it had subsequently. So once you get to the, 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 the decisive moment is the fourth century, because what happens in the fourth century? Well, you have the Edict of Milan, you have the, the end of persecution under Emperor Constantine of the Christians. And now the Christians are allowed to build churches. They're allowed to go into a basilica above ground. And the, 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 I would say there was a kind of um, pent up energy, right? That, 
that the liturgy develops very rapidly after the fourth century, as if the Christians were just dying to get into those basilicas and, you know, and to unfold all of the riches that they had pondered in their hearts. So that's when you have, from the fourth century on, you have the development of solemn liturgy, of uh, basilica liturgy. So with the, with the priests, deacons, subdeacon, acolytes, lectors, you know, all of these different roles, these different ministries, ordained ministries. Um, and from that point onward, there is a steady, consistent, harmonious growth in the liturgy from the fourth century. Well, I'm saying from the fourth century in terms of what we, what we know from our historical records, um, because actually the historical records are very, um, they're kind of uh, imperfect and scattered. So we have to do a certain amount of hypothesizing. But from the fourth century onward, you definitely have this development of solemn, public, chanted liturgy which reaches, at least in the Roman tradition, right, in, in that part of the, of, of the Christian world, it reaches its apogee in the solemn high mass, the pontifical mass, really, uh, the Tridentine pontifical mass. That's like the pinnacle of the Roman apostolic tradition. And there's no point along the way that you can point to and say, oh, look, there was a big rupture there. No, there was never a rupture. It was always like, okay, we got these things and now we're going to add another procession. We're gonna add more incense. We're gonna add some more chanting, right? It's just adding and elaborating what's already there. That's the basic way that liturgy develops, not by subtraction by or by rupture, but by a continuous harmonious growth. Okay. So we have, we have the liturgy, um, uh, experiencing organic growth and development and then and then the 20th century comes along and um there's growing talk of reform so why why was why was and why was there seen a need for reform um and in what sense could it have been uh legitimate um and um needed and um what happened uh like whose idea was it to rupture <laughs> in your words <laughs> change everything around sure i think in a, a good way to answer your question is to look at the liturgical movement the history of what we call the liturgical movement um so basically uh the the grandfather or the or the founding father if you will of the modern liturgical movement is a man named dom prosper Guéranger. He was a French Benedictine in the 19th century who was, he was very important um, for many reasons. One is that he refounded Benedictine monasticism in France after the French Revolution, right, had destroyed all of it. All of it. Um, he also was a very strong supporter of, of the papacy and, uh, and an opponent of Gallicanism. So the, the, the idea of like the French national church, sometimes the way people talk about the American Catholic church, well, the, you know, the French national church. Um, and its own regional liturgies. He wanted everybody to have the Roman rite, the Tridentine rite. Um, but, but really what he's probably best remembered for is, is he wrote this large series called The Liturgical Year. It's a beautiful set. It's about 15 volumes of meditations on every day of the liturgical year. And of course, we're talking now, we're in the 19th century, so we're talking about the, the liturgy of, of Pius V. Um, codified at the Council of Trent in 1570, or after the Council of Trent in 1570. So what, what Guéranger's aim was this. He did not want to change the liturgy at all. He just wanted the lay people and the clergy to understand and appreciate the liturgy, the riches that were already there. So his, his attitude would have been something like, we have this immense treasury, but so many people are ignorant of it. So many people show up to church and they just pray their beads, which is you know, not to be condemned, but they, they pray their beads and they just, they kind of listen to the priest mumbling off in the distance and then they go to receive communion and that's it. And they don't, they're, they're missing out on this kind of mystical uh, treasury that the liturgy offers. It's the highest form of prayer uh, that the church has. And yet people had kind of become detached from it and ignorant of it. So. Guéranger's emphasis was learn the liturgy, know the liturgy, love the liturgy, live by the liturgy. That was his whole motto. That was the whole spirit. Mm -hmm. The liturgical movement kind of followed that for a number of decades by, for example, publishing hand missiles, right? We all take for granted that we can get a St. Andrew's missile or a Baronius missile or an Angelus Press missile. You know, we take for granted that we can get this, this nice little leather covered volume with six colored ribbons in it. And we can follow every prayer of the mass, both the changing prayers, the propers, and the and the the, um, 
the unchanging prayers, the ordinary of the mass. But that was, an, that was something that Guéranger and the liturgical movement brought about for the sake of introducing and people to the mm -hmm. actual texts of the liturgy. So that, that's a different, that's not really reform. That, that's a kind of educational or catechetical reform, not a liturgical change, right? That's, so it's very important to understand that's, that, that was the original vision. When you get into the 19, it kind of varies from, from country to country, but 19, even the 20s, as early as the 20s, 30s, definitely in the 1940s and 50s, mm -hmm. you get a, a, a more and more radical version of the liturgical movement, still calling itself by the same name, but now with the idea of we need to simplify, we need to abbreviate, we need to vernacularize, we need to find ways to get the laity actively involved in the liturgy. Um, it's not enough anymore for them to know the traditional liturgy. They, we need to change it. Either people are too stupid to follow it, it's too complicated, it's too archaic, mm -hmm. it's too elaborate, or, or actually, we don't agree with the theology in it anymore. We don't like this patristic medieval, uh, you know, it's too dark, it's too ascetical, it's too anti-worldly, it's, you know, it's too, it, it doesn't have any modernity in it. Modernity is absent from this. <laughs> uh, and so we, we need to transform the liturgy to accommodate it to modern man and the modern spirit. That's the more radical phase of the liturgical movement. And unfortunately, that is definitely what kind of took up the reins during and after the Second Vatican Council. Okay, so that's, uh, so now you're bringing in um, Vatican Council too. Um, and uh, mentioning Vatican Council II brings to mind uh, the Pope's motu proprio, trad traditionis custodes, because he cited uh, Vatican II and more specifically a purported rejection of Vatican II as one of the reasons uh, that he issued this um, instruction. So um, maybe we could turn to that motu proprio as a, um, right now and um, talk about that, uh, that one reason, the purported rejection of Vatican II, what that, what that could mean. Yeah. Um, and also uh, the other principal reason in his motu proprio was uh, unity, fostering <laughs> church unity. And um, so, I mean, on the face of it, you could say, you know, that uniformity of, uh, of right might be a way to achieve unity, but there's, I think there's something deeper that you, you might want to discuss about that. And obviously there's 23, what is it, 23 rights in the, in the church. So it can't be strictly speaking uniformity of right. So if you right, could, right. you know, talk about those two aspects yeah. of uh, the Pope's mode proprio. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot there. I mean, this is you're, these are like the greatest hits of all possible questions that you could be asking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so Vatican II. No, let's talk first for a moment about unity. Um, so the, it's a fact, it's not open to dispute that in the history of the church, and what, by the church, I mean the church, the Catholic church, the universal church all over the world, and therefore in its Western sphere and its Eastern sphere. I mean, basically the, the Catholic church has always been somewhat bifurcated between the Latin world and the Greek world. And this from mm -hmm. early on um, and increasing as time goes on and becoming tragic, of course, in the 11th century with the final schism that still endures to this day. Uh, but basically you, you always had two different spheres of liturgy and, and even within each of those spheres, a multiplicity of liturgical rites or uses, if you wanna use a more technical expression. Um, there was more unanimity in the West for example, the, the Roman rite, the Ambrosian rite, and then all these different uses like the Carthusian use, the Dominican use, all these different religious order variations, they all used the Roman canon. So there was a lot of unity to, to yeah. in that sense, but much diversity in other respects. The Dominican rite has different chant. The Ambrosian rite has different chant than the Roman rites. These are all different, you know. So, um, and you know, then you have the Mozarabic rite in the West as well, which is quite different. And then in the East, there's even more diversity. I mean, you know, for everything from the Coptic rite to the Syro-Malabar rite to the Byzantine rite that's most familiar to people if they know anything about the East. Um, so liturgical uniformity has never been a feature of the life of the church. Um, unity has been understood more in terms of unity in the creed 
and unity in, in morals, in how we live the faith by the commandments, then it, ha then it has been understood in terms of prayer practices, whether public or private. You know? Some people say the Jesus prayer, some people say the rosary. Nobody questions, the, the, that. nobody says that's gonna destroy the unity of the church, right? Um, I think the particular problem is that in the Roman rite, within the sphere of, of the, the influence of the Church of Rome and the papacy, there, there always had been one Roman rite. I mean, from early on, from the time of St. Gregory the Great, at the latest, uh, and, and certainly before Gregory the Great, people were doing something in Rome. So the Roman rite has always been single for the, for the Church of Rome, the papacy. And um, when, when Pius V promulgated the missal, his missal in 1570, it did create a kind of expectation that if you didn't have your own long-standing liturgical rite or use already, you were going to be following the rite of Rome, the 1570 yeah. missal, that's what you were going to be following. So, it, so Pius V did, in response to the Protestant revolt, he did introduce a very strong note of liturgical unity into the Western church, right? He didn't abolish all the different rites and uses, but, he, but there was a, a new centralization and a new insistence on, you know, here's the right that we're gonna follow. Um, and I think it's, it's because that spirit was so dominant in the West for four centuries that when Paul VI created a new missal or when he approved the new missal, he just assumed that, oh, this is gonna replace Pius V's missal, right? This is, this is the new single uniform missal for most of the Western church with very tiny exceptions. Um, and that didn't happen because the reform was so radical that always a group of people didn't accept it. They, uh, there was always a group of people, we call them traditionalists now, mm -hmm. who said, no, this reform was way too radical. It violated all kinds of principles of liturgy, of history, of theology, even of Vatican II, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute. Uh, and so we, 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 we don't want this new liturgy, we want the old liturgy. And so that's why you have this very strange situation now of two Roman rites, because they really are, I would, I would argue as a liturgical scholar, they are two rites. Uh, they have some resemblances, but they're two different rites. Uh, and it's a strange thing because never in history have we had two Roman rites. So I think that's why some people get all bent out of shape about it, right? They want one Roman rite. That's the unity uh -huh. that they're, they're looking for. Um, but about, about Vatican II, very briefly, <clears throat> the fact is that Vatican II is, is like a bundle of contradictions. This is the problem with Vatican II. It's a bundle of contradictions. The people who were there uh, you had a progressive liberal faction, the Rhine flows of the Tiber, right? You had the progressive faction. You had a smaller, but still pretty well organized group of conservatives and, and more traditionally minded. You had, you had people who didn't know what to think. And you had documents that were constant compromises between these different factions. And then you had people behind the scenes like Bonini and I would say Paul VI, who they knew that they wanted to drive things in a much more radical direction than the council fathers had actually ever discussed or agreed on. Uh, and then they did so because, well, because the Pope is the Pope. He can apparently do what he wants. At least this is, this is the thinking of ultramontanism. Right? So it's, it's not a secret anymore that what 99%, that 99% that of the celebrations of Paul VI's missile uh, decisively depart from certain desiderata that the council fathers voted on in, in Sacrosanctum oh. Concilium, right? I mean, everybody points to this, you know, that Latin shall remain the language of the liturgy with some exceptions. You know, Gregorian chant shall have pride of place, chief place is actually a better translation. You know, that uh, pipe organ is to be, you know, used. And, uh, you know, the, the changes to be made should be s small and organic, you know, and uh, it, I mean, it's, it's amazing when you read Sacrosanctum Concilium, how much the reform departed from it. And even Ratzinger talks about that in many, many places and many other people talk about yeah. it too. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, what we got wasn't what the council fathers discussed. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it was in a way theoretically possible given the loopholes in so you know, there, there were many loopholes, you know, this is gonna be decided by the Episcopal conference. You know, that's a big loophole right there. So it, it, it's kind of a mess. It, it gives you an almost, it gives you many possible scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore it's really difficult to say, what is Vatican II actually asking for? That's a very difficult question. Um, and then there's just the problem of the spirit of Vatican II, which, which you know, goes far beyond any of the documents, what we call the spirit of Vatican II. And yet that seems to be the driving force with people like Pope Francis and Archbishop Roach and others in the Vatican mm -hmm. 
they're not interested in what Vatican II says. They're interested in what it means for them, for their generation, right? what it meant. What it meant was an overturning of the Tridentine church, an overturning of a church based on dogma, inflexible moral rules, and a fully developed liturgical right with detailed rubrics. Right? That's what they, they wanted to reject all of that. And that's what they're doing. Right? Again, right, back to the 70s. The crossroads becomes the Second Vatican Council. The council called to be pastoral, explicitly so, saying all our dogmas are settled. Therefore, we don't want to enter into any discussion. But what we have is a problem in the modern world of communicating those dogmas efficiently, effectively, attractively to the world. So let's have a council, we'll call it a pastoral council. We'll call it the second half of Vatican I, which was ended by military intervention. And we'll deal with certain issues perhaps that weren't quite finalized with regard to the bishops and their role, because Vatican I dealt with papal authority and the role of the Bishop of Rome. We didn't quite finish that. So we'll have a pastoral council and then they sent in the post Second World War period, the 1950s, as Europe is being rebuilt, somebody had a very large checkbook apparently and decided to buy 2,500 airplane tickets <laughs> for the bishops or maybe ships, ship tickets. And then for each of them had an assistant and maybe a secretary and maybe a second assistant and perhaps another theological advisor. I imagine there were five or six Every time there was a bishop, there were several others. And they all came to Rome and they intended to come for three months in the fall of 1962, when I was a little boy, actually. And I remember it was uh, Winston Burdett speaking to you from Vatican City. And they announced in Time Magazine and at all the world press that the Catholic Church, this Colossus, was about to change and was going to open up to the modern world. <laughs> Everyone was very excited and Xavier Rin wrote about it and Malachi Martin was involved. Robert Blair Kaiser, who I came to know was the reporter for Time Magazine. He was 30 years old. He had been a Jesuit for 10 years. He's passed away now. He was very close to Malachi Martin in more ways than one. And um, I had a fascinating four or five hour conversation with Robert Blair Kaiser about 15 years ago. And he explained to me that he'd been given the assignment by Claire Booth Luce, the wife of Henry Luce, who was also quite closely connected with American intelligence services to assist the process of the modernizing and the revolutionizing of the Roman Catholic Church in order to make it a kind of useful partner with the United States of America in developing a modern world open to democracy, open to religious freedom, etc. In the midst of all of this, the council has a collision of like an iceberg against the Titanic. And people said, we can't get everything decided in three months. In fact, We'll get rid of all the documents that were prepared and we'll rewrite everything, but it's going to take years. And so the council, the first great decision of the council was it won't just be done in the fall of 62. It will go for many more sessions and the entire church will be brought into the dock. How can we be effective and teach the modern world, which is seeking uh, peace, seeking a resolution between this Europe divided in two parts between the Soviets and the Americans and the Vatican officials like Paul VI, we're all excited about the church playing a useful role in the progress of humanity. Therefore, everything was up for grabs. And it's right here where you rightly put the finger into the, the punto dolente, they call it the, the wound in the side. Was it possible to change the church? Was it possible to modernize the church? 
was it possible to take a series of hopes like that Dom Garanger had, uh, as you so beautifully expressed it, galvanized an entire liturgical movement, which was the movement that inspired my father and other people who raised us, who experienced in the 20s and 30s and 40s, that old Catholic church that many people do still remember, but is increasingly now is becoming quite remote, correct? So yes. here we are in the 1960s, a council, and uh, Don Gino Baleri, who used to run the Leoniana bookstore right next to St. Peter's Square, He's still alive. He was there in his 20s as the council began as a young priest, an Italian. And he knew everybody, still knows everybody, knew Paul VI. And he said, Joseph Ratzinger came out in the first day of the council in a jacket and tie. He was 35 years old, 1962, October 11th, by the way. And uh, started to hand out mimeographed sheets to all the bishops as they came out that day. And the sheet said, we must overthrow the schema of the curia. We must vote to open them up for rewriting, not just rubber stamp them. So that was the first great decision of the council. Joseph Ratzinger was fully participating in that. And the fascinating thing about him, who's, who's now, 94 years old, he's going to be 95 in April, living his very quiet life, whether or not he's a prisoner, I don't know, but living his very quiet life in the Vatican. He, in his itinerary of life, came to think that maybe he had made a little bit of a, a youthful mistake and given himself over to this revolutionary spirit and maybe had made a mistake and he tried mightily once he was elected Pope to come to a compromise solution, which he issued 14 years ago, Sumorum Pontificum. And he's now watching Pope Francis undo that compromise solution and say, no, we must have one. I mean, he's more absolutist and in a sense, papalist than Benedict ever was. Benedict was allowing both traditions in a sense to flourish. So all of this we watch from the sidelines here as ecclesiastical leaders take the Second Vatican Council, try to channel it into something that they then claim is in keeping with what it intended. And our whole lives have been affected by it, the spirit of the council. And the question we could go on and talk for hours, and I'm talked, I've talked much too long, but I'm very, very emotional about this because it affects the belief of children and the the attitude of children and, and, and adults and, and young newlyweds, et cetera, towards how they're going to live their lives and who they believe God is and what they really ought to do and how important it is to do it. All of this is up for grabs. So the spirit of the council claims that a new springtime was given to the church. Hi, thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking on that red subscribe button and click that bell so you'll be notified when we upload new content. Check out all the links below for subscriptions to Inside the Vatican Magazine and to the Morning Hand Letters, which is free to your inbox. You stay connected. It's content that you can get nowhere else. All that information is below. Thank you.